We're going to go ahead and uh, get started at this time. Uh, just going to do just a slight change in order, and we're going to get into the meat of the matter, and I have Dr. James Cloyd, uh, who is professor of pharmacy at the University of Minnesota, and he's going to talk about a big trend, which is looking at our rescue medications. So, Jim, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Servin, and it is indeed a pleasure to be back. I've been out of the epilepsy loop for about two years, and it is with great uh, appreciation that I've been able to rejoin the community. Uh, let's see here. These are part of my disclosures, and they are relevant because some of these companies are involved in the development of rescue therapies. I have a couple of other disclosures. My father had epilepsy, and on this day after D-Day, it's appropriate to note that he was um, a Navy um, officer and also in the Office of Strategic Services and fought behind the lines in Burma. And <laughs> there he, he acquired Malaysia, uh, malaria, and uh, part of that malaria infection uh, re eventually went to the brain. He developed epilepsy. And on occasion, as a pharmacist in his pharmacy, he would have seizures. And as the um, lowest member of the family on the work totem pole, I would sometimes be there to try to administer some kind of help, which was woefully inadequate at the time. We've come a long way. I have a couple of other disclosures to make. I'm a clinical pharmacologist, and you're going to see some tables and slides that are written in pharmacology. It has been shown that this kind of information causes somnolence, Nausea <laughs> and vomiting, and for that reason, I am lowering the dose. If I fail to speak in English, please let me know, and I will translate. But I will try my best to make it clear to all. Now, uh, let's see if we can, can we go back. Thank you. As I thought about what, the job, what my job was today, it occurred to me that uh, perhaps we needed some appreciation for what's old in rescue therapy. And I'm going to tell you this because it is a story about how the epilepsy community has had an impact on the development of new therapies. Now, uh, I've learned, thanks to Patty and others, that uh, Rather than calling these treatments for seizure emergencies, the better way to look at this is rescue therapies to prevent seizure emergencies. And so in this diagram, which looks like a triangle, you can see that for those individuals where there is a propensity for recurrence of seizures, that's a good time to treat to prevent it from either escalating to status or continuing to, the patient continuing to experience uh, repetitive seizures. Likewise, uh, another optimal time to treat would be when the seizure seems to be lasting longer than it ordinarily does. And these are the conditions in which one might uh, provide rescue therapy. At the end of my presentation, I'm going to tell you one other possibility for rescue therapy that represents a very exciting uh, future development. Now, this is a big problem. Uh, and the numbers are fairly uh, uh, rough in terms of their accuracy. Uh, the best estimates we have are that those with epilepsy, and this would typically be the individuals with refract refractory epilepsy, about somewhere around 100 to perhaps 165,000 people have something along the lines of an acute repetitive seizure uh, phenomena. Some other people will call these cluster seizures or serial seizures. In general, they mean the, same th mean the same thing. Many, many people with epilepsy end up in the emergency department, and oftentimes um, this is because of breakthrough seizures for some reason or another. The most serious of the seizure emergencies, status epilepticus, is a common occurrence in emergency departments, uh, as many as perhaps as many as 250,000 episodes per year, but with fewer than 200,000 individuals. Now, the good news is there is some evidence to suggest that the number of patients going to the emergency department for prolonged seizures or status epilepticus is going down. And we think this might be because there's better management of 
uh, events such as acute repetitive seizures are prolonged seizures at home, work, or in, while you're traveling, in school as well. Rescue therapy started early, but with a bumpy start. Now, St. Valentine met well, and he attempted to cure people with epilepsy using a blessing. However, the Italian, or I think it was the French FDA, demanded controlled trials, and in those trials, blessings were no better than no blessing at all, which may turn out to be a blessing. All right, so we move to the modern era. What do we want from a drug, or a device for that matter, but in this case a drug, that might be used for rescue therapy? Ideally, you want a simple approach. Therefore, one or perhaps two drugs that would treat this wide variety of seizure types that Dr. Porter and Dr. Soule discussed. You want a wide therapeutic index. Now, this is one of those pharmacology terms that really is quite simple to uh, explain. A wide therapeutic index simply means that you need this amount to produce your desired effect, and you need this amount before you have an adverse effect. The wider that index, the better the treatment. You want the drug to be potent, and uh, some people confuse sometimes potency with efficacy. Potency simply means that you need a certain amount of the molecule of the drug to produce your effect. Highly potent drugs require only a few molecules, relatively speaking. Now, we need this because if you think about where we put rescue therapies, they tend to be in small spaces. The rectum, the nose, maybe the buccal cavity, or maybe it's even an injection. So you can't deliver large volumes of fluid in those spaces. Therefore, you need potent drugs. What other properties do we need? Well, you need a, a, a drug and a device that allows you to provide this medication quickly, safely, and easily. Rapid onset of action, there's, that's obvious. And now we're talking about minutes. However, the ideal preparation would have is what I'm calling an intermediate duration of action. If it works, you might have a little bit of that somnolence or drowsiness, but you don't want it to last very long. And so we look for compounds that will produce the effect quickly, have a, an adequate period of protection to prevent recurrence, but then the effect will dissipate so the person could go on to activities of daily living. And of course, we want a compound, a product that has few or no monitoring requirements. In nature, has given us a family of drugs that fit most of these characteristics. They are called the benzodiazepines. You're gonna see an abbreviation for that later, BZD. And you've heard of these drugs, Valium, Versed, Xanax, uh, Ativan, and of course they have generic names as well, and we'll be using those generic names. But we have the tool chest from which to develop uh, the products we need. Now, Here's the first problematic slide, and I'm showing you this because of what it can tell us about how to understand whether a product's going to work well or not. And with my able assistant in the back, I want to direct you to the y-axis. I can't do this because of the position of this lectern. And that axis, uh, that particular axis shows uh, what's called the spike count. It's a measure of the frequency of spikes on an EEG. It's not seizures but it represents abnormal electrical activity. On the other y-axis, very good, is the concentration of a drug called diazepam given rectally. And if you follow those two and you look down at the bottom on the x-axis, you'll see time. Look what happens when an individual gets a dose of rectal diazepam on the EEG. How quickly does it change? Gosh, it looks like it changed in about 15 minutes. And was there a concentration associated with that change? Yeah, around 200 nanograms of drug in a mill of blood. That gave us the information we needed to determine that a drug like diazepam, Valium, might be useful, and we had a target concentration that might guide dosing. That's a principle 
that we can now apply again and again for new rescue therapies. So how did diastat start? It started because the epilepsy community demanded that we have something better than what was going on at the time. And this story, I am proud to say, in the United States starts in Minnesota. Now, we don't brag very much. It's against our rules, ask Garrison Keeler. But <laughs> this is one occasion where we'll uh, have an exception. Bob Crowell is a wonderful pediatric neurologist. He practiced at a specialty children's hospital in uh, St. Paul. And he had word from one of his colleagues in Europe that the Europeans, particularly the French, were using a rectal form of Valium to treat seizures outside of the hospital. And he came to me and said, can we do the same? Well, we, don't, we didn't have a product, but we went down to the pharmacy and we grabbed a vial of injectable Valium. We grabbed a syringe. We got some needles. We got some Lubrifax. And then the, sec the most important thing is we went to the nurse in the epilepsy clinic and said, can you construct and develop a teaching module to train families how and when to use this jury rig system. And Carolyn Joan Sadie, who is still involved in epilepsy, did that. We then carried out uh, a study. This was 1982. Uh, not as well designed as perhaps we should have, but we were working on a nickel and a dime. And we found out three years later that this intervention was highly effective. It reduced emergency room visits. Families said things like, we can go out on a date or go on vacation. The next part of this story, and let's see, it was Roger who said serendipity. Serendipity means those chances of fate that occur in life. And I'm sitting in a uh, conference uh, across the room from a former graduate. I'm trying to remember her name, and so I... I, I uh, fake that by saying, where do you work? And she said, Upshur Smith Laboratories. What do you guys make? Well, we make a rectal aspirin and a rectal Tylenol. We just got approval for a rectal morphine solution. Has that shaft of light ever come down to one of you? <laughs> so sitting across from me was a representative of a, one of the few companies in the United States that would even think about working in this space. And Upshur Smith jumped on board began the development of this with uh, assistance from our group at the university. The FDA jumped in on several occasions, including getting orphan designation for this product. The NIH jumped in and funded the first pivotal trial, and the academic community joined in, nurses, pharmacists, and uh, neurologists, adult and pediatric neurologists, to make this work. It was a wonderful example of a community-driven effort to develop a product. This slide, the y-axis shows the probability of having no seizures. That's the response rate. And on the x-axis is time after administration of diastat. And within literally 15 minutes, you begin to see a separation from the treatment group from the placebo group. And I want to do a shout out to all the nurses who were involved in this because they were on 24-7 providing backup for the families who were using this treatment because if the treatment didn't work, the families were going to need help, and the nurses were just remarkably supportive of this. You don't see separation like this in many drug trials. This and another trial led then to the development of our first formally approved rescue therapy called diastat. Uh, it's now considered a standard. It's in the textbooks. However, and I may use the word but, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. No At least in Minnesota, we found that if you were over six years of age, you did not want your pants pulled down at the Mall of America. <laughs> so there were people who would benefit from this therapy who were reluctant to accept the therapy. And actually, there were clinicians who were reluctant to talk about it. So then came the next wave of development. And I'm going to talk about four uh, there are three areas listed here. There'll be an additional one I'm going to briefly mention. Buckle. Now, what does buckle mean? Buckle means that you uh, lean on the side, uh, or at least your face is on the side. You open up uh, the pouch, if you will, of your cheek, and you put in a little uh, liquid medication. And uh, this, in fact, uh, is available in Europe. Uh, this graph on the x-axis is the y-axis is the concentration of drug, and this compares the Dazzle versus IV versus the solution 
in the buccal pouch, the cheek pouch. And you can see that the drug concentration, that's called the, uh, the, the time of the maximum concentration is 30 minutes. And in some studies, it's even faster. And it's pretty well absorbed. So buccal is actually a possible option with some caveats about putting something in the mouth of someone who might be having a seizure. Uh, and I've listed here the advantages and disadvantages. It's on the handout, and I'm not going to belabor this, but the actual onset of action even precedes the peak of the drug concentration. These products are available in the United Kingdom and in Europe. Uh, it may be possible to import them. It's probably not easy. Uh, but I do not know of a company that's currently working to develop buckle therapies in the United States, so keep that in mind. Now, let's go to intermuscular and subcutaneous, and I'm aware of at least uh, two drugs under development, and I'll just quickly show you a couple. Uh, there is an auto-injector of diazepam that uh, has been developed uh, by now Pfizer, and this graph simply shows the drug concentration of an IM administration versus a comparison with rectal. And as you can see, the drug concentrations reach a higher peak, a higher drug level, and a little bit faster than rectal. So this might be a possibility, but let me show you the next slide. This is a remarkable study uh, done by a group of uh, academics uh, led by Dan Lowenstein and Rob Silvergleit, in which they asked the question, could a cohort of emergency medical technicians give IM, auto-injector midazolam, versus an IV drug, Ativan or Lorazepam, for patients in the ambulance who have status. And they carried out this study, and at the conclusion, if you look at these two bar graphs, the higher response rate was actually with IM midazolam versus IV lorazepam. IM beat IV. And why? because about 10% of the time, these really skilled emergency medical technicians couldn't establish an IV line. Now that's real world. So you're going to see, I believe, uh, at some point in the future, a therapy around at least IM, auto-injector midazolam, that might be useful in, acute, uh, in a seizure emergencies and there's rescue. You can even give these drugs subcutaneously, not into the muscle, but in the little tissue below your skin. And there, uh, it can be done in a needless way. Now, this is a graph simply showing uh, Versed or Medazolam and the time course for the sub-Q injection. The higher peak is IV. IV is always going to win. But the second option is how quickly can the drug get in by another route. And you can see that the peak concentration here is within 5 to 10 minutes, subcutaneous an auto-injector, needless, subcutaneous, you have in your purse or your coat pocket. Lastly, internasal, and I'll be quickly, uh, quickly go through this because my dear friend is giving me the high sign. <laughs> uh, this is your nasal cavity. You probably haven't looked at it this way in, in the past. Uh, let me just say a couple of things about your nose. It's actually a small cavity. It doesn't have a lot of surface area. Uh, and therefore, you need very small amounts of the drug. And it's an active organ, if you will, and there's mucus and other things causing things to drain out of your nose very quickly. So you have to give your drug in a very small volume, and it has to be absorbed fairly quickly, otherwise you're going to swallow the drug. So this is a remarkable piece of work done by Lahat and others in England, in which he asked the question, very much like that uh, emergency medical technician study, he said if the kids come in with long febrile seizures to the emergency department, and I have a choice between giving IV Valium or internasal uh, midazolam, what would win? IV, internasal, same problem. And you can see here that when the physician said give drug now, that cute little nose indicates where the nurse was able to give the internasal midazolam because all you had to do is drip it in the nose. It took about four or five minutes to get the IV Valium ready. The response rate shows that the response is actually faster with internasal midazolam than IV diazepam, but if you wait about eight or 10 minutes, it becomes a tie. So work is underway now on both internasal midazolam and internasal diazepam. 
Uh, this is one example of how fast you can see this is work done by a product that is now under development by Upshur Smith. And the, the peak concentration here, the Tmax, occurs in 10 minutes. The response is likely to occur even earlier. We and others have been working on internasal diazepam in the past, and you see a similar picture uh, where uh, certain nasal solutions of diazepam can also work fairly quickly, but it appears not quite as quickly as internasal midazolam. We'll have to see if there's any difference in terms of outcomes. So this brings us to where we are today, and it's all good news, folks. We have the following. The, the route is, if it says IN, that means nose. If it says inhalation, that means you're breathing it into your lungs. IM is intermuscular, sub-Q is under the skin, and buckle is uh, in the pouch of the cheek. Uh, these are the drugs that are listed, the sponsors of the companies in which these are under development, and I'll just briefly say something about status. You now know what phase one means, thanks to Dr. Porter, uh, and the diazepam products are under development, and some are potentially in late stage. Midazolam is phase three. Clonazepam, uh, that company appears to have stopped development. We're working on a, a less toxic, uh, water-soluble uh, prodrug of one or other of the benzodiazepines. To, yesterday, we learned about a very exciting development with aprazolam inhaled, and it looks like it'll have a very fast onset. The last thing I will point out is that uh, I am midazolam, diazepam, excuse me, uh, will be more friendly to you and to the patient than before. And the most exciting thing I can tell you is that in the not too distant future, it is likely that we're going to be able to couple devices that predict seizures. Let me be clear, predict seizures. And you're gonna couple that with something that you can give. It could either be a closed loop or it could be an external application that works very rapidly so that you stop something before it happens. Thank you very much. Perfect, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Um, uh, we Please remember we are going to have a panel, and if you have questions, write them down so that we'll have that available uh, for questions for the panel in a moment. We're going to go back to our, our first order. We have Dr. Jackie French, uh, professor of neurology at NYU and also head of the Epilepsy uh, Studies Consortium. And Jackie, I'll turn it over to you. You see, obviously I have paid dearly for not being here when this started because I now have to follow Dr. Cloyd, which is absolutely impossible. So, but I do have one little addition, which you've probably heard. I actually have two little additions to your wonderful work with Diastat. So the ad campaign was when all else fails, in the end there's Diastat. <laughs> 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 and also, the second one was the bottom line in seizure control. <laughs> but we do hope that we will move away from those. All right, but seriously, folks. Uh, I am here just to tell you, you know, the pipeline is moving so quickly that all I have time to tell you about in the 20 minutes that I was given, which is now 19, I, I just gave away a minute in a joke. Shouldn't have done that. Um, <laughs> What's, what's coming, what has just come within the past year, and should you think about taking it? Should you think about taking a brand new drug? So let's get started. Uh, this is just to remind you, as you've been hearing all morning, that things are going very, very quickly. The line of new anti-epileptic drugs is going up extremely rapidly, and we have a few that have uh, come in the last, as I said, year. So what do we know about new epilepsy drugs when they go through that wonderful pipeline that was laid out by Dr. Porter and they are finally approved by the FDA? So we do know from the phase one, phase two, phase three trials that they have an ability to control seizures. And this is usually tested against a placebo or a sugar pill, as you've already heard. But we only know that for usually a single seizure type. And the seizure type that is usually the one that's tested very early is focal, what we used to call partial seizures, complex partial, simple partial seizures. These are seizures that come from one spot in the brain. 
We know this for people who have failed multiple other drugs, people who are called treatment resistant or refractory, and we know that only as it is measured against, again, a sugar pill. So both of those are added on, and we know that the new drug is better than nothing. You know, we would like to know a little more than that, but that's what we know. We also know something about how tolerable the drug is, but we only know how tolerable the drug is when used as it was used in the trial that was performed over a very short period of time. And we'll talk a little bit about what the implication of that is. What do we know about safety when a drug is approved? We know about safety in the population that was exposed during the trial um, phase one, phase two, and phase three. And usually that's anywhere between, depending on what kind of drug it is and what kind of trials have been done, anywhere between 1,500 and 15,000 people. Now there's something called the rule of threes. Now you would think that if you test a drug in 100 people, you know the side effects that occur approximately one in 100 people. That would make sense. But in fact, statistics say that is not correct. If you test a drug in 100 people, you only know about how many side effects occur in one in 33 people. That's the rule of threes. You have to expose three times as many people to know that one in 100. If you wanted to know one in 100, you'd actually have to expose 300 people. So if you've tested 1,500 people, that means you probably know serious side effects that occurred about the frequency of one in 500. One in 500 is pretty rare but it's not extremely rare. So there are things that pop up after the drug is approved and more people are exposed, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So all of this comes down to the fact that this is what we know at the time a drug is approved, and this is probably what we don't know. And we've been talking over the last couple of days about the fact that drugs really prove themselves when they go out into the clinic in terms of what they can do, what they can't do, how good they are, how safe they are, how well tolerated they are. So there's still a lot to learn. Having said that, what do we have that now is in the clinic and we're going to learn a lot about? We have one new drug approved in 2011. We've already learned a lot about it since it's been approved. That drug is called ritigabine or patiga. And I'm going to subdivide these drugs into what I call revolutionary and evolutionary. So revolutionary drugs are drugs that we know work with a brand new mechanism of action, and we know what that mechanism of action is. And we hope that because the, the way they work in the brain is very novel, that they're going to help people who maybe weren't helped by other drugs with different mechanisms. And then there are drugs that are evolutionary. And the way I describe evolutionary drugs is everybody's got their cell phone. You remember what the first iPhone looked like. And now we have a much, much better iPhone. And I bet you, or whatever it is that you use, um, that when the new version comes out, everybody's going to want it. So that's an evolution. And we've done quite a bit in cell phones as well as in drugs with moving things along and making better versions. So the evolutionary drug here is S-like carbazepine or aptium. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then we also have three new sustained release formulations, and I'm going to talk about why you should be excited about that. So we have Oxteller, which is a sustained release oxcarbazepine. We have Trikendi and Qdexi that are both sustained release depyramates. So let's start with Patiga, because I think not a whole lot of you are going to be taking Patiga, but we can learn a lot from what happened with Patiga. So Patiga actually is a drug that Dr. Porter spent many, many years of his life bringing to the clinic because in animal models it is a fantastic drug. Actually, in um, clinical trials it was a very, very effective drug. And it has a brand new, shiny, exciting mechanism of action, which is that it works on most drugs that we use, or many drugs that we use, work on calcium or sodium channels. And this one works on potassium channels. And whereas the others are blockers of channels, this one is actually a channel opener. So it's a completely different mechanism of action. One that we kind of have a reason to believe has something to do with epilepsy, because we know that 
babies who have a genetic defect in this channel have seizures. So we know that this channel has something to do with producing seizures. And the drug was initially approved, as I mentioned before, for add-on treatment in partial or focal seizures. And this is the results of the trial, one way to look at them, looking at the difference between, and we, we talked before about how expectations can make people better. So this is how many people actually had a 50% drop in the number of seizures they were having over the three months of the trial. And you can see even when only a sugar pill was added, 18% of people, which is not too shabby, had a 50% drop in seizures. But when they took the highest dose of the ritigabine or patiga, 44% of them had a 50% drop in seizures. And as, as seizure medications go, that's pretty darn good. So we were kind of excited about that. But unfortunately, <coughs> after two years, Patiga got a black box warning because the people that actually were in the early trials who had been on it for the longest period of time came to their doctor and started to report something very unexpected. They started to report that their fingernails and lips and the whites of their eyes were turning blue. And that is a unique enough thing that immediately people started to realize that it must be related to the drug. And whereas having blue lips and nails cannot be considered to be a wonderful thing, we wouldn't worry so much if it was controlling people's seizures, except that when we looked in the back of people's eyes, the back of the eye, called the retina, was also blue with pigment. And that, people worried, could affect people's vision. And when they looked at these people's vision, they found that even with any kind of eyeglasses, they couldn't correct them back to 2020, some of them. Unfortunately, we didn't have any vision testing before they went on the drug. So we can't know that this is absolutely due to the drug, but it was worrisome enough that there is now a black box warning, and that drug is now going to be sort of the last in line of the new drugs to be used. And this is what I'm talking about. Sometimes it takes a while for a side effect to show up, and we don't know, in fact, if people took Patiga for years and years, whether everybody would get this or whether some people would get this, I personally still have people taking Patiga who are doing very, very well, who didn't get success on any other drug, and we're watching them very closely. Um, you know, we're, we're just observing, they're observing, and we send them to the eye doctor every once in a while. But obviously, this is something that only could be learned with time. The next drug I'm going to talk about is Prampanel or Ficampa. It's also revolutionary. It's the first drug to work on excitation rather than inhibition or stabilization of membranes that I was talking about before. So you can look at this. You know, we have lots of drugs that try to inhibit seizures. And you can think about that. If you think of seizures like a fire in the brain, then I'm going to come and throw a blanket over it to try and get that fire to go out. That's inhibition. Now, the way that I would work on it for excitation is that I would take away the kindling or the match. And this is sort of what this is doing. It's inhibiting an excitatory chemical in the brain called AMPA. So we're taking away the kindling of the fire. And this uh, drug is approved, again, for add-on treatment in focal seizures first, although there is a trial that just completed for generalized tonic-clonic convulsions, the most severe you know, form of seizure, and we're very excited to see whether the drug is going to work on that as well. Now, how did it do in the studies? You can see that in this study, um, the sugar pill got a quarter of people to have um, a, a significant reduction in seizures. Um, but the 8 and 12 milligrams of parampanel did better than that with 37 and 36 percent. As far as side effects, very, very common side effects that we see with medications for seizures, dizziness, sleepiness, some irritability, and unfortunately this drug didn't have to wait two years. They already got a black box warning, and the black box warning is for severe aggression and homicidal ideation. That doesn't sound very good, <laughs> but it's extremely rare. 
And, you know, if I tell you, <laughs> I know, I know, it's not, but if I tell you right, right now, I know that this is a possibility, look out for being, uh, you know, fe having these feelings, we're going to know very early on and we're going to be able to manage that either by lowering the dose or taking you off the medication if necessary. So we think of this as a manageable side effect. I mean, I'm not going to put you on it and tomorrow you're going to go kill your mother, I promise. Um, it's just something you're going to have to look out for and if you start feeling those aggressive feelings, then it needs to be managed. Uh, let's go on to S-lycarbazepine acetate or aptium. And this is an interesting drug. If people are worried about what are we going to find with new side effects, this might be the drug for you because it is not really a completely new drug. This is the one that I said was evolutionary. So it's closely related to a drug called oxcarbazepine or trileptal, which has been on the market for several decades. And when oxcarbazepine or trileptal which is a prodrug, enters the bloodstream, it immediately gets transformed into mirror image compounds. We call them an enantiomer, and they're called S lycarbazepine and R for the left and the right side of the mirror image. Interestingly enough, S lycarbazepine, as the name might imply, is just the left side. So that means that all of those hundreds of thousands of people who have already taken oxcarbazepine have had this chemical in their body. So if it was going to cause people to turn blue, we would know that already. So in that way, it's, it's maybe a safer bet than some of these brand new compounds. But the question is, if we're giving the left and the right, and now we're only giving the left, why, why would we do that? What's better than oxcarbazepine about this drug? Well, first of all, there seems to be less effect on blood chemistry. So one thing we watch very closely for people on trileptal or oxcarbazepine is that the salt in their blood can drop. And that seems to happen less when you give only the left side of the compound. It seems to be released more smoothly, which reduces side effects because when blood levels bounce up and down, as I'm about to show you, that can really have an, effect, uh, an impact on side effects. So it's a smoother release into the bloodstream. And in fact, it only needs to be given once a day, whereas um, immediate release oxcarbazepine has to be given up to three times a day. So that's obviously an advantage. Hopefully it will work equally as well, and it remains to be seen whether it's going to be better. It's also been approved in Europe already for 18 months as the drug Zebinix, so we do have some experience with this aptium already. Now let's talk a little more about the immediate versus the slow release. So when you take a drug that stays in the bloodstream for 8 or 12 hours, you can see um, I've, I've put arrows there. You take your dose. It gets released, and, and Dr. Cloyd was talking a little bit about release into bloodstream and that kind of thing. It gets released into the bloodstream, and immediately you get a peak. It's called the C-max, the maximum concentration. And then slowly, slowly, the body eliminates the drug, and you have less and less in your bloodstream. Then you take another dose, and you get another peak. Now, sometimes that's not a problem. But other times, now I've, I've tried to show on this, on this slide that the green is sort of the, the, you know, between the green line and the red line is what we call the therapeutic range, where you want to keep the amount of blood in the, uh, drug in the bloodstream in order to not have side effects, which would happen if you go above the green, and not have seizures, which might happen if you go below the red. So if you have a drug that has a short um, uh, transit through the blood, you can actually have peaks and troughs that can both get you into trouble, okay? And in addition, let's say you need more drug because the amount, you know that when you have a breakthrough seizure, the first thing that the doctor often does is say, take a higher dose. Now, under these circumstances, taking a higher dose may actually get you above the red line, but it's going to get you even higher above the green line. So you may have more and more side effects, particularly when the drug is first uh, released at Cmax. And a lot of people with certain drugs will come and say, and, and trileptal is one of them, after I take the drug for two hours, I'm dizzy. And they are feeling that peak, 
and I see even some nods in the, in the audience. They're feeling that peak. So wouldn't it be nice if you could stretch that line out, right, so that you don't get the peaks and you don't get the troughs? And then you can actually increase the dose and not go above the green line. You can actually get better efficacy with less side effects just by changing how the drug is released into the bloodstream, and that is the science behind a sustained release formulation. So the first sustained release formulation that, that came out was Oxteller, which is a sustained release trileptal, and trileptal does cause those peak dose side effects, so we're very excited about that, and you can see that in the U.S. part of the study, um, the amount of people who got a 50% reduction in their seizures was 52%, so that's not bad. So we're very excited about Oxteller, and even people who didn't do well on trileptal might do better on Oxteller. Now, I'll tell you one problem with the sustained release formulations is that they are very expensive, and a lot of insurance companies right now are saying, we won't pay for them, just take the drug more often during the day. But it's not quite the same thing, so we're going to have to fight that battle. And I fight that all the time, quite honestly. Um, topiramate is another one that is coming out in sustained release, and I just want to point out the 200 milligram dose in the original uh, formulation, which was immediate release, and you can see that it wasn't that much better than the placebo. So a little less than 20% of the patients on placebo, as in other studies, had a reduction, a 50% reduction in seizures, and a little, you know, about 25, 26% on the 200 milligram dose, and those two didn't even separate statistically. But now look at the 200 milligram dose in the sustained release, where you see now almost 40% of people having a 50% reduction versus the placebo. So for, for whatever reason in the sustained release, it seems like the ability to control seizures was quite substantial at a relatively low dose. And a relatively low dose, as we said, means that the side effects will be less. So less of the sleepiness, dizziness. Uh, sometimes you get uh, tingling in your fingertips with topiramate. So this is something, again, to consider even if the immediate release didn't work. So finally, I'm going to say, should you try a new anti-epileptic drug? Well, if you've tried all the ones that are appropriate for you and they haven't worked, it may be time to move on to a new one. Well, how do you know you've tried all the appropriate ones? You've got to ask your doctor, unfortunately, because there are 20 drugs out there, but not every drug is appropriate for every person. You should discuss the risks and the benefits the data that's available, like what I've showed you, you know, what's the likelihood that I'm going to get my seizures reduced? What's the likelihood that my seizures are going to go away altogether? What's known about the side effects? Was my particular type of epilepsy or seizure studied in a study yet? Or are you just presuming because it worked in another seizure type that it might work in my seizure type? So in summary, there's interesting, novel, evolutionary, and revolutionary drugs in the pipeline. Lots more coming behind, as you already heard about. Sometimes a small change, even a formulation change, can make a big difference. And there's potential now for new screening models and other things that will make uh, the future. Um, maybe it won't be what it used to be, but maybe it'll be even better. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Again, when you have questions, write them down as we'll have a panel right after all the talks. We're going to shift a little bit to the topic of medical marijuana, and uh, we're going to start off with two perspectives. We're going to start with the medical one, and that's with Dr. Derek Chong. He is an assistant professor of neurology and epileptologist at NYU in New York, and I'm going to turn it over to Derek. Great. Thank you. Um, so how many people here consider themselves experts at marijuana. Do you have any experts? <laughs> no, no takers. Okay. No, no one's, I mean, we're in California. It's legal here, isn't it? It's, um, all right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some teaching, I think, first of all. Um, I hope this projects. It, it's actually a very complicated uh, uh, plant, and, in, and the terminology is actually very complicated, too. So let's uh, discuss. Uh, cannabis is the Latin name for the plant. It was uh, derived from the Greek, um, and it's actually synonymous with hemp. 
Um, in the 1700s, they decided to make it an, an official scientific term. So it's cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, so it's the genus. And now it's used by botanists and pharmaceutical companies. The term marijuana, uh, generally, currently anyway, refers to the leaves and the female flowers or the bud of the cannabis plant. Um, but it can refer to the whole plant itself. Uh, the name was derived in the U.S., but kind of uh, stolen from the Mexican immigrants who used the, the, the term marijuana, either spelled with a G or an H there. And um, they, the, there was a lot of campaigns against both the immigration and the marijuana, and so they were trying to use this very negative term. It sounds foreign and dangerous, and they would also call it loca weed as well. And that was in the 1930s or so. The term hashish comes up every once in a while, and that's uh, the the term. The name is derived from the word for grass in Arabic, and um, it come, it's a resin or an oil that comes off the glands off of the the cannabis stalk, and it has uh, some of the substances are very similar. Now, hemp is is the cannabis plant, but it it currently refers to a specific um, subtype that's grown purely for industrial purposes. Um, it, the, the cannabis plant has very uh, strong fibers, so it's excellent for rope, for clothing, for uh, paper. Um, and the hemp subtype has very minimal quantities of any psychoactive substances. It, and, and I'll show you a picture of it. It looks very different. That They really are interested in the bare stalks rather than the leaves and the, and the flowers. The term cannabinoids are substances that act on the uh, cannabinoid receptor in our cells and you know basically people would t take cannabis and they would feel funny and they would wonder some people would wonder anyway why they feel funny and they figured that something in the plant so they call them cannabinoids and then they figured that there must be some receptor in our body that it's uh, t uh, attaching to or modulating uh, so then they came up with a cannabinoid cannabinoid receptor and they found it and then somebody thought well if we have receptors in our body, what are they for? So we, we actually must make our own cannabinoids. And we call this endogenous cannabinoids or endocannabinoids. So as it says here, we make them ourselves, we discover them much later, and um, you can read that reference there if you're more interested about them. What is important for today is to understand the system itself. So uh, there is one receptor that's called the CB1 receptor or CB1R, and it's there here in that little purple squiggly guy. Um, this picture is of two neurons. So the top neuron is, is the, what we call the presynaptic neuron. It is the talking neuron, so it's talking to the guy below it, who's the listening or the postsynaptic neuron. And we have these things called synapses, and the synapse basically is the, the, the location of where the talking occurs, so this picture right here. So let's think about an excitatory synapse. So the glutamate is an excitatory synapse. It's one of those things that uh, Jackie French was talking about, the kindling part of the, the fire, so it's excitatory. Anyway, so when the top guy talks to the bottom guy, it excites the bottom guy. And um, what, what happens is that the bottom guy then releases some of these cannabinoids that float upwards onto the top guy and basically tell it to chill out. Okay, that's kind of the function of it. It kind of makes sense. So, so then your synaptic activity for the subsequent responses from the top guy actually goes down. Okay. Now that sounds great for seizures, right? You, you, you want to reduce that kindling fires and all that sort of stuff. The problem is, is that these guys also uh, exist on inhibitory neurons, so your GABAergic neurons um, tend to be calming neurons. And so if you inhibit a calming neuron, you may have insufficient inhibition to be able to blot out seizures, so like your natural defense system against uh, seizures. So in every brain, in every region of, uh, of the brain, that balance between how many CB1 receptors are on the excitatory versus the inhibitory can, can differ. So it gets kind of complicated, and that's why maybe it's quite a unique um, uh, system. Um, so we actually have CB2 receptors too, and you can see there on the left, um, the CB2 receptors live on the immune system, um, and we're not really going to talk about that very much, it's just to kind of 
give you an idea of what the whole system's all about. And the uh, CB1 receptor, as you can see here, uh, lives in the brain and central nervous system. I'm going to skip that slide. We're going to go to this slide, which is about um, where we have the CB1 receptors in the human brain. So you can see the cerebral cortex, so it affects higher cognitive function. Uh, here in the hippocampus, learning memory and uh, stress, maybe reducing all three of them will make you less stressful, but you also won't learn much and remember why you were stressed. Um, the cerebellum that controls movement, um, and this is why I think uh, it causes people to not do very much of it. Um, the medulla is, uh, there's uh, receptors in there that deal with uh, nausea and vomiting. So this is why uh, marijuana is good for uh, nausea, because it actually ends up reducing the, re the reception and the, th that causes the nausea and the vomiting, so for chemotherapy and such. Uh, whereas in the hypothalamus, um, it actually increases the appetite. So as you can see, the, 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 how the receptors, uh, excitatory and inhibitory, are in the different areas of the brain, you actually get uh, some things increase and other things decrease. So let's talk about the exogenous cannabinoids. So these are the things that we find in the plants. So THC and CBD, those are our two main ones. THC is a uh, short form for delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, and it is the substance that we think is the psychoactive one. It's the one that causes euphoria. It may also be uh, contributing to the anxiety. And it's the one that really binds strongly to the CB1 receptor. So it's an activator of that receptor. It chills out those neurons. The CBD is cannabidiol, and it's not psychoactive at all. It doesn't really bind to CB1 or CB2, and when it does bind, it doesn't activate. In fact, it, it antagonizes it. So when it binds, it actually blocks the THC from binding. So it actually opposes some of the effects of the THC. And so when, you, when there's all these different varieties of uh, marijuana out there, and they have different uh, levels and ratios of THC and CBD, you, that's why you get kind of different levels of euphoria and anxiety and calming. So there's uh, two main species, the ca cannabis sativa and the cannabis indica, and they look a little different in the subleaf structure. Um, both species have about 80 cannabinoids, so THC and CBT are the two main compounds, but then there's over 70 other ones that are floating around. In addition to over 400 other compounds that have been uh, found and isolated, some of which also have effects in the central nervous system. So um, the, the sativa species tends to have more psychic and stimulatory uh, properties, sometimes and uh, causes a lot of anxiety, and that's because it tends to have a lot more THC than CBD. The indica strains tend to be more sedative, mellow, and people feel very heavy with it. Um, and then there's very many hybrids out there. Um, hemp, so uh, the hemp there is shown on the right. Um, you can see the person there, and, and basically it's like a tree. It's taller than the person, and there's a lot of stalk and then a, a few of the leaves. On the left, you can see um, like a hydroponic lab, I guess. I got these off the internet. Um, so so, so the, the, they're very short and very broad, and there's mostly leaves and flowers, and so that, you know, you're going to expect a lot more THC out of the one on the left than the right. So hemp... Uh, looks very different. It's uh, tall and thin. There's hardly any THC actually in the plant. You have to smoke about eight times as much to be able to get the same um, response um, of, of hemp than the other one. Um, and unfortunately, there's not that much CBD in them either, relatively speaking, to some of the other plants. And that, that'll come, become important in a second. So hemp and cannabis, it's been around forever, uh, 1800 BC or BCE, depending on um, what term you like to use. And it's been used both for the industrial stuff and the uh, medicinal properties as well. In the uh, 1800s, even in the US, it was indicated for multiple things, neuralgia, depression, uh, etc. And in Ohio, it was even indicated for epilepsy back then. And then, you know, in the 1900s, as I said, with all, all that uh, negative press, it sort of disappeared. And now it's kind of come back in the past uh, 10 years or so, or uh, the past uh, maybe 100 years, actually. So uh, I guess 
50 years. Well, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, so, so we have a bunch of animal models. People became interesting, interested in this, particularly in the 70s, I guess. And um, what's important here is THC, the, that little bar that showed up there. You can see 61% of the studies showed anticonvulsant effects. 29% showed no effect. But 10% actually showed a pro-convulsive or tended to cause seizures. And CBD, on the other hand, 81% anticonvulsants, 19% no effect, but no, none of the studies have shown that it promotes seizure activity. So that's important. Um, the CBD then has anti-seizure effects without causing a lot of the side effects that you might get from the THC part of things. Um, human data, is, uh, the, the first stuff that came out was anecdotal and it was very similar. I'll summarize the slide saying that um, people either did better or it had no effect. Um, in survey, so a lot of people have been using uh, marijuana for many years for their epilepsy. It's only now become uh, more seriously looked at. Um, so this is a study from Edmonton that looked at 136 adult patients and about 50% had used marijuana at some time. And as you can see, you know, um, about 50% thought that their seizure severity and frequency improved um, by using it. It's interesting that although 50% were had used it sometime in their life, only 15% had used it in the last month, meaning that uh, I guess a lot of people didn't get that much benefit from it or had some side effects. So, you know, it, the retention there was actually not so good. Um, this uh, survey was published in 2013. It was, um, uh, they found a Facebook group uh, for people, who, uh, parents who had found a CBD-enriched medical marijuana, and it was sort of like a, a Facebook support group. So they did a survey of, um, of the parents to see uh, what sort of effects they thought were going on. Of course, this is biased because they're in the support group and they obviously it's they seem to think it's working. So you're going to you're going to get positive results, but it's still interesting to see what happens. So the dose was quite variable. So on the second line there, uh, from less than 0.5 milligrams per kilogram today uh, to 30 milligrams per kilogram per day, which is huge because you multiply it by how many kilograms that person is. So if someone's like 40 kilograms, that's a, that's a huge difference. And the THC uh, amount didn't vary as much, but it still varied. Uh, most of these um, children had Dravet syndrome, so 13 of the 19 were Dravet. Uh, this is a, a graph I stole from the GW Pharmaceuticals website, but about this study. What you can see here on the rightmost bar is that there was a greater than 80% decrease uh, in about 50% of the children. Uh, of their seizures, and two children were reported to be seizure-free. In terms of side effects, um, there was better sleep, and uh, actually better alertness, and a better mood, and uh, decreased uh, self-stimulation. And um, actually, appetite decreased, and, and uh, about 40% had some drowsiness. But that's about all that they reported as being negatives. So th the positives uh, very much outweighed the negatives in terms of the side effects, not even talking about the seizures. Uh, so of course, surveys are biased. We know that. Uh, it still provides some information. Um, and s but it, it, well, what we really need are clinical trials that are less biased or not biased at all, uh, preferably. So uh, here's a summary slide of four clinical controlled CBD trials. The yellow box there highlights the number of patients total since 1978, which is less than 50. And only half of them have been on the CBD, and the other half were on placebo. Again, the summary here is, uh, very little uh, adverse uh, effects except for some drowsiness, and people were either did well, uh, had less seizures, or were seizure-free, and maybe half of the people had no, no response. Um, so that leads us to the, um, uh, the current study that uh, we're doing now, so the Epidiolex study, which is 98% CBD. Um, it's extracted, uh, it, it's a very, uh, so this GW Pharmaceuticals gets it from plants, but they're all marijuana experts there, so they get really high levels of CBD from their plants. Um, and basically this is an open label study. So uh, there's six sites, and each site was supposed to enroll 25 patients each, and ev every one of the uh, children with treatment um, refractory epilepsy would get the uh, medication. And um, 
uh, NYU actually, I mean, uh, b because I'm from there, I, I know we had like 100 patients who wanted to be on it and families who wanted to be on it. And so, I mean, our enrollment went so fast uh, that they allowed us to add another 35. So we have, um, you know, 60 patients who are in the study now. Preliminary results, uh, according to GW Pharmaceuticals, will be available in the next month or so. And, uh, you know, this is going to be biased as well because, uh, you know, um, everyone wants the study to do well, um, but part of it is f for the um, uh, safety and f to try to figure out what doses um, might work, um, and that will be uh, helpful for planning a randomized controlled trial, and that's really the only way that we'll be able to get a CBD product all over the country, because once it's uh, approved by the FDA, we can get it everywhere. And the problem here, my last two slides, <laughs> is that um, uh, it's really the high CBD um, substances are really only available in Colorado and California. And this is, uh, this is a case of, um, of uh, Charlotte's web, so uh, Charlotte Fiji. And we're, we're actually gonna have uh, Sophie's case uh, presented uh, here just in a second. So I'm gonna skip these summary slides and just go to this last slide here where you know, cannabinoids, there, there's a lot of miraculous claims. The, the problem is that they're all not tested. And we need very rigorous testing of very, um, you know, the same dose and uh, the same supplier to be able to know what works and what doesn't work. Okay. To kind of get a more uh, personal and patient uh, perspective, we have Elizabeth Aquino, who is going to kind of provide that perspective for us. Elizabeth. I have a timer up here. Okay. Hello, I am Elizabeth Aquino. I have um, much experience in the world of uncontrolled seizures because my first child, Sophie, was born in 1995 in the dark pre internet days, and she was a normal baby and born normal term and went home and was nursed and breastfed. And then around three months, she was um, o diagnosed with infantile spasms, which, of course, back then, when there wasn't an internet, I was told, oh, don't read anything about it. It's so bleak. Just take your baby home and start giving them high dosage ACTH shots, but don't read anything about it. So, of course, me being me, I'm a writer and pretty opinionated and strong. I ran up to the Barnes & Noble. This was in Manhattan, and I went up to Barnes & Noble that had just opened up, and I went to the, the bookshelf on children with special health care needs, and I pulled down the Freeman book, Seizures and Epilepsy in Childhood, and I opened it up to infantile spasms, and there were two lines, and they're like uh, in my head to this day about how the has a particularly bleak outlook and only 8% of children diagnosed with it will go on to do well, do well. So of course, I we were going to be that 8% because that was the way I was. Well, we were not. We were the 92%, which means that Sophie is now 19, and up until... We started Charlotte's Web in December. She had um, every type seizure you can imagine, atonic, tonic, clonic, partial complex, all um, diagnosed of unknown origin. She was on 22 drugs, two rounds of the ketogenic diet, tested for surgery, but thankfully not a candidate, which is a whole other story. But um, I guess that path led me from New York to California. And we saw the best neurologists, as we, most of us who are parents and advocates will take our children to the best neurologist. And I think in preparing my, my words today, I, I mostly, because I'm a writer, I'm mostly struck over the 20 years that I've been doing this by sort of a disconnect between the family and the medical profession that I still, as a writer, kind of chew and mull over it because I think a lot of it has to do with 
why would they understand if they don't themselves have epilepsy or have a child who has epilepsy? So I would let them off the hook for that bit of it. But on the other hand, I see the same thing happening now with the medical marijuana, the kind of disconnect in communication between what those of us who have watched our children seize with you know, unremitting for years and years and years every single day, um, and then finally find something that helps them. And instead of there being sort of an outpouring of excitement, and I, I think it calls for it, um, that there should be, um, a, the, the motivation should be less the cautious uh, and, and more like, wow, that's incredible. Let's, let's figure it out. Um, I think if I hear one more time about we don't have uh, long-term studies that show the efficacy of medical marijuana, I, I feel a little bit like I might scream, and I don't think I'm the only person. I think there are a lot of parents out there because I can remember day, I don't know, 5,000 when, uh, not 5,000, I can remember those top neurologists literally saying to me, prescribing drugs at this point is more an art than a science, or there's a dartboard, let's take another hit. And I think that that's like a reality, and to acknowledge that the reality of the way our babies and children have been prescribed drugs up until now, I mean, it's a crapshoot. We all know that. And although the medical community doesn't need to say that, I think acknowledging it, the, the, dark, the darkness of the field with these kids that have uncontrolled seizures who have been on multiple drugs in combination, it should be acknowledged. <clears throat> so anywhere. So where Sophie was seizure-wise, so she's 19, and I also have two boys, one's 15 and one's 13. And like one of the other speakers said, all this affects the entire family, and it's devastating. My other big beef about it is I don't want to hear about miracles anymore because the cost of, if, if medical marijuana helps your child like it's helped mine, it's not a miracle. There's an enormous cost behind all of us. 19 years of watching your child seize, of her bursting her head open, of cutting her mouth, knocking out permanent teeth, having her little brothers help me drag her to her, you know, it's, it's intense. Having your marriage straight, fra frayed, having um, exhaustion, everything, we all know that. We heard it from a few of the other parents. It's unlike any other um, disorder, I believe, and I have many, many wonderful friends with children with all different kinds of disabilities. And we all agree that epilepsy for medically refractory seems is unique in its devastation in families and, and for people. <coughs> and I get a little emotional. Um, so the miracle thing, I just said, like, I, I don't like it being called a miracle because it takes also so much work. There are people who have been working and working and working, whether they're growing the plants or distilling or making it, a Realm of Caring Foundation in California and Colorado. I mean, these people are working. It didn't just drop out of the sky, Charlotte's Web. It's like a long chain of, of, of work and work. And now, thankfully, the medical community's on board and contributing to that work. So if you could just think of it less in time, terms of a miracle and more that there's like a whole lot of people working toward it and it didn't just drop out of the sky. It seems that way <coughs> for me because, um, like I said, the great cost. So Sophie is 19 and she's been on 22 drugs and is currently on Onfi and on um, Vimpat. And she's been on both for many, many years and her seizure control was this. She had between, up until the end of December, she had between one and five tonic-clonic grand mal seizures a day. Hundreds of myoclonic spasms. So every morning she would wake up and have maybe 40 minutes of 
spasms, kind of like the old time infantile spasms. They look like that, just myoclonic. And then they would slowly dissipate and she would have a few hours and then she might have another cluster. So she had those, she had partial complex and periodically she'd have a drop seizure, but the drop seizures disappeared when she was about six. She used to have, I don't know, a hundred a day or something. But so this is the end of December, but the big tonic clonic were happening between one and five times a day. And she was, of course, she's kind of amazing because despite that, she's still up. I mean, she can walk, but she's nonverbal. She wears diapers. We feed her. We assist her with everything, bathing. She's profoundly developmentally disabled. But she has a certain um, um, kind of intense like awareness that you that I've always kind of clung to despite the seizures and the medications in that she's almost like trapped in there. So um, years ago when I took her to a Chinese doctor, the Chinese doctor said, she in there, she know. And I've always like said, I mean, that's kind of terrifying because of all the stuff that we do to her, but it's also been a big motivator for me to keep going when I wanted to lie down on the floor and just give up. So how I got the medical marijuana is I am a writer and I'm also a big advocate. I've worked for many years with the Epilepsy Foundation. I founded a nonprofit called PACE. I uh, was on the board of the Epilepsy Foundation in LA. I worked for years as the parent co-chair for Project Access. So I'm very familiar with all the systems of care and all that. But I knew that if I had to do the medical marijuana, it was going to be me. I wasn't going to get any help. So I went and got a card. We live in California. I haven't, I, I, I'm not a pot smoker, but I went to get a card. It was hilarious. It was alarmingly easy. And I encourage all of you to at least go get a card and see what the whole scene is like, because <laughs> why not? I think I told him that I had stress, and that's how I got a card. So then I got a card, and then I went and started looking for high CBD, and it was nowhere. I couldn't find it. There was one-to-one. -one, there was high CBD that turned out not to be high CBD. So I had nothing to give her. Then I found someone in California who did have the product. It wasn't it was 14 to 1 ratio. I gave it to Sophie. She responded. I can't tell you how because it, at first it, she just seemed different, alert, more alert. So then we, as a big surprise, I had also been on the waiting list for Charlotte's Web. And as a big surprise at the end of December, Ray, who's here and you should visit his table for Realm of Caring, we were one of the first 26 families that went home with our very own bottle of CBD of Charlotte's Web. So we gave it to Sophie. It's a tincture of the oil. And within two weeks, she had um, the first day and then two with no seizures in her life. So we're talking 19 years. Um, it was kind of so shocking that our family just didn't talk about it because you know, we're, I'm Italian and they're jinxes and I just wasn't going to talk about it. So we didn't. We just kind of went along our way. And then she went two weeks with nothing, no seizures, nothing, no, none at all. Like crazy, right? Crazy. Not anecdotal, not, there is no placebo effect there. I know when she's having a seizure, she, know, she doesn't know anything like that. She had no seizures. So she had a few breakthrough seizures, and then we started kind of experimenting with dose, which is ongoing. So to this day, she's going up to three weeks sometimes with nothing, no seizures. Now, side effects. These are the side effects. She started, I think, how do I progress my thing? I'm sure I have to leave, sorry. How do I do this? OK, that's her and me. That's a picture that I took when she started smiling again. She hadn't really smiled in about 10 years. Over the years, her affect dulled down, which uh, here's my geek Venn diagram, which I was excited to see you had some. I was thrilled. I have a friend who made this for me. And since diagnosis, which will be next week, which is symbolic to me that next week will be 19 years. She's lived 6,935 days when the slide was made. She's been on pharmaceuticals only 
6,772 days. She's been on CBD 163. She's been seizure-free on those 163, 121 days. And if you can see that the days on CBD completely envelop the seizure-free, or the seizure-free days are enveloped, and there's literally never been a day on pharmaceuticals where she's had seizure-free. So December 13th, she had a terrible fall. She had a drop seizure and smashed her nose. And I, uh, I think there's a handout that I wrote about it. And then we went and visited her neurologist at USC in April, who I'm going to secretly say almost jumped up and down when she saw her because she was seizure-free and very alert. So her things are smiling. She's alert. She sleeps well. She's a profoundly changed. She's in there, and now we, we do know it because she's showing us. So that's it. Thank you for that very powerful story. We're going to begin our panel discussion, and, and, and that's why I had everyone sitting here so that we wouldn't have to kind of uh, spend some time uh, at this moment. But I'm going to start off, uh, we, we kind of uh, uh, started with that. Uh, we were going to have Maureen and myself talk about how do we take these medications and put it into practice. And so I'm going to, in the spirit of honoring the fact that we, we were very nice in giving our time, I'm going to turn to Maureen and ask that question. You just heard about new rescue drugs, new uh, ongoing maintenance drugs. You just heard about cannabis. cannabis. How do you incorporate this into day-to-day -day practice as a health practitioner? So are you going to turn it on over there? Or am I supposed to do something here? It is working. It's working. It's Great. So um, I'm a nurse practitioner uh, here in the Bay Area at Stanford. My only commercial disclosure is that you can walk to Google from my home. <laughs> so <laughs> that's out of the way. Um, so in moving uh, therapies into day-to-day um, -day life and practice, I thought about the example of moving therapies into schools. And I'm hoping that the next big one to come to move into schools is going to be intranasal midazolam. I work with uh, many different counties, uh, dozens, hundreds actually, of school nurses throughout Northern California, and there are concerns about it. Um, so based on both literature and myself as a person who's been working with kids with seizures for 45 years, my suggestions are, my recommendations are to both make it personal, as we've heard so eloquently from families here today, and then also take a systemic approach. And I think the personal approach is um, making sure that that school nurse meets you and your child and you sit down together to do that seizure action plan. I receive literally um, dozens a week, hundreds over the course of a school year. And very often, the school nurse and the parent have never spoken. And I think it's so important that your child, of course, is more than a piece of paper that's faxed to me in some office someplace to fill out. So that individual thing, and the individual thing is not just meeting with the school nurse. Sometimes it's meeting with other school personnel and a shout out to someone I know here. Sometimes it's going to the school board meeting to make sure that they know your child too. And then we look at the systemic approach and this is sometimes um, where we can improve and that is you're not the only parent, I'm not the only pr nurse practitioner dealing with this. And I think it's easy sometimes for me to feel that way, and obviously for parents. But gather with other parents that you know, that you meet through the Epilepsy Foundation, that you meet because your children are in school together. Because when a group of parents comes together and says, countywide, we need a standardized action plan. We need all schools to be on the same page. We need to all talk about risks and benefits. And while schools are very often ready to talk about the risks of rescue medications, the theoretical risks of respiratory depression, it's on us to bring up the actual known risk of prolonged seizures, which can result in emergency room visits, hospitalizations, even intubations in the ICU. So 
that would be my response. Maureen, thank you. And, and I want to now open this up for uh, having the larger audience have questions. Because this is being streamed not only in this room, another room, and as well all over the internet, I'd appreciate if you could please come to the microphone so we can kind of start the question and um, uh, we can kind of go from there. And I don't know if anyone would want to uh, uh, start us off. Uh, do you have a question? Yes, please. Yes, I do. I'd like to ask Dr. Chung. Uh, my son, uh, Kevin, had epilepsy, but my older son has uh, uh, high-functioning autism um, Asperger's, which I guess is not a diagnosis anymore. But ha do you have any um, indication of medical marijuana being helpful for autism? Um, I, I'm actually not too familiar with that. Um, I, I, I do know that people are trying to see if it helps with uh, some of the anxiety uh, components uh, to it, and again, it would be the high CBD um, uh, variants that that I think they're engaging in. But I actually I, I don't know that much. Is anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. We do? Wait, oh, wait, I'm we sorry. Do. Go ahead. We, we have uh, please. I have heard um, a, a, about a lot of people who are using the high CBD with their children. A lot of children who are autistic are also epileptic, and many of them have self-injurious behaviors, and I've heard from people that it's helping at least that aspect of it in addition to seizures. Thank you. Over here, yes. Uh, Maureen, I just wanted to thank you for your comments on the, the school system. It certainly um, is a challenge uh, for families. And um, I just wanted to share, I'm in Virginia, so it's a little bit different there, but um, I wanted to share that one of the things we've done in working with schools is just try to be really active with everyone in the school, the county nurse, the, um, the clinic aid. We don't have nurse in the school. Um, but we've been able to get uh, rescue meds in by working with those people. I know there have been challenges with that in, in California. Um, and one of the things we also did is we have an IEP for our son. And we fight really hard to keep that IEP because it's just more um, uh, powerful than a 504. Mm -hmm. And it gives us so much more support. And, and really it gives the school the capability to have more, offer more support. And when we were talking about what was going to be best for our son, we requested that they put in the, in the IEP that there would be a seizure training prior to school starting every year. And every person in the school who had access to Evan would be in that meeting. And they all said, yeah, that's a great idea, because they're terrified of Evan having a seizure. And, um, but what we didn't realize at the time is we'd put it in the IEP, which made it a legal requirement. And we just wanted what was best for Evan, but what we did was we held the school accountable, and they were a partner in that accountability, and that first meeting was 30 people. So it was, and we do it every year. It's in the IEP every year, and it's really made a difference in awareness for the, um, the, the school, the teachers, the administrators, as well as um, making them feel safer, and our son is safer. So I just wanted to share that, and thank you so much for sharing what you did. And thank you for sharing with us as well. Yes, please. Uh, my question is for Elizabeth. Um, our stories, you basically told my story. I'm seven years behind you and I have a son and not a daughter. But uh, Brock had infantile spasms, has Lennox Gastow, hasn't had a day without seizures in 12 years. And uh, did, I guess, do you have any concerns as a parent that, that people are getting too MMJ focused and, and losing sight of the big picture? You know, for us, I'm trying not to use the word miracle, saying over and over in my head. Our miracle was the, the corpus callosotomy. For Brock, he went from two or three drop seizures a day to none after that. And you know, seizures that would knock teeth out. That would, he, he went from wearing a helmet to not wearing a helmet after that surgery. And I just get concerned, you know, on message boards, everywhere you read, everybody's just, it seems, losing focus. And, you know, we just, we've got to do this. And, you know, we've got to a good place through some of these therapies that are currently available. And I'm not opposed to medical marijuana, but I, I just fear parents are losing the big picture and getting this picture. 
I'm, I'm not really sure what you mean by losing focus. If, if you, I, I get what you're saying. I don't think it's losing focus. I mean, most of the people who are trying me medical marijuana have been on multiple drugs. and In fact, they try medical marijuana, and then they're stuck with trying to get rid of multiple drugs. Um, so I don't, I don't well, quite like understand. I, I read a story re recently that said a family with a one-year-old was moving to Colorado because that was their last hope. That, that's sad for me. I have a son that's 12 mm -hmm. and been on multiple medications, had mm -hmm. multiple brain surgeries. He has the VNS. He's done the keto. Right. I don't feel like we've been through his last hope. That just concerns me. That I guess I would say that I, I would, I, as a person, I mean, I, I, I've, I'm thankful that I'm a meditator because when Sophie stopped having seizures with the medical marijuana, there was a part of me that was pissed, angry, like, what the heck? Like, really? Medical marijuana after all this stuff that we've been pouring down her throat for 20 years? And so I don't, you know, I, I think if I had a child who was one, I guess it's hard to say in hindsight. I mean, our lives have been, her life was wrecked by seizures and drugs, wrecked. And if I could back up when she was one years old and, and try medical marijuana, I mean, what's the downside? It doesn't work. Then you don't do it. What if it works? I mean, you're still going to have, and people are concerned about like the long-term cognitive effects. Well, what do you think happened in the last 19 years with 22 drugs? So I don't think that it wouldn't, it doesn't concern me. I mean, I'm, I'm sure like if I were a medical professional and also if my baby was a year old and I'd be all worried about, I, I would worry, but looking back in hindsight, oh my God, I wish that I would have been that one year. I would have, yeah, because yeah, if it we'll doesn't go. work, then you don't do it. If it does work, you're going to avoid brain surgery, VNS surgery, 22 drugs, side effects, aplastic anemia, suit up, you know, a dulled person who can't walk straight, who can't drive, who can't, I mean, the, the cost is so huge, I think. So no, I don't think that people are jumping the gun. I think it's the first exciting thing to happen since the ketogenic diet and Jim kind of I, I opened the People magazine that day in 1995 and read about his son, who was about my daughter's age, and I was on the next train to get do the ketogenic diet. So, And at the same time, people were saying the same kind of thing. Oh, no, we can't do it. Oh, no, it's, you know. So, I, I no, I disagree. And we have two more panelists. I want to actually address that. I'm going to Jackie and then Maureen. I didn't see it, Dirk, but why don't you go, Jackie? So I, I totally get where people are coming from, and I think that if they want to try medical marijuana or cannabidiol, they by all means should. The reason why, as a medical professional, I think we still need studies while, you know, you're trying it as necessary is because we need to know the order of things. So, you know, uh, with all of the drugs that I mentioned, there are miracle cases. But if we didn't know how many non-miracle cases there were, we would presume it was a miracle drug. So, you know, it may be that medical marijuana is going to be 100% effective for 100% of people. It may be that it'll be 10% effective in 100% of people. People need to know that as they're making decisions. So it really is a question of, yes, it's a miracle, but for how many and for whom? Who is it going to benefit? Who is it not going to benefit? Are there risks? And without, believe me, without doing, you know, comparison studies, you know, we wouldn't know the risks of a lot of things, we would only know the benefits. We know, for example, the ketogenic diet is an incredibly effective, but it does have risks, and we know what to look for. So, you know, that's why, at the same time, I totally get, you know, um, I saw Dallas Buyers Club, and it impacted me. I totally get that we need access now in order to, you know, help people who are suffering now, but at the same time, we need the information to know the order of things. That's what I would say. So I'll turn to Derek right. and then Maureen, and, and then we'll go to another question. So, so um, yeah, th there are costs involved if you don't live in uh, Colorado and uh, California. Uh, to be able to get CBD anywhere else is illegal, and um, you can try to import hemp oil, which is actually legal, but the quantity of CBD in there is, is so little that you need to buy about $300 a day worth 
to be able to get the equivalent amount that you get here. And people have done that in the Northeast. We've had patients get CBD from some, there's also some alternate shady individuals who are able to get oil for our patients. And um, it hasn't worked for everybody. So they, they did try it. They spent a lot of money to give it a try, and it, and it didn't work. Um, but yeah, the order of when you would use that is, is very important. And um, um, I think uh, um, Paige uh, Fiji was very clear yesterday saying that uh, she doesn't want people to have false expectations. It's probably not going to work for everybody. And so you don't necessarily want to move your entire family until you kind of at least have some sort of trial basis where you've kind of figured out that it does work. So I kind of understand both uh, perspectives. And you know, our goal really is to be able to get it to the, to the market so that everyone can give it a try without having to go to extraordinary measures. But unfortunately, that's a few years away. Maureen, one final word on this, and we'll go over here. Just very quickly, I think this discussion really points to the whole idea of risk and benefit, and that's a very individual thing for every child, every person with epilepsy, and every family, so that the risk of one seizure every three months is quite a bit different for a typically developing 17-year-old who's driving, going off to college, and playing ice hockey than a seizure every three months is for a baby who's being cared for constantly. And the long-term effects risk and benefit ratio also has to ta be taken into account. And um, I just, it applies not just to schools, but to individual treatment decisions too. Thank you for that very thought provoking question. Let's go over to this side. Uh, I have a question for Ms. French. You yep. talked about different uh, medications and how like we're really lucky a lot of different ones are coming out. Uh, how many medications would you suggest until you consider a different method? Because I've now done 11 medications, I'm on three, and that depends if you consider short-term and long-term. It's an excellent question. Um, there are many, many medicines, and, and somebody worked out how many years it would take to try them all in all combinations, and it's longer than your lifetime. So. Unfortunately, we can't try them all in all combinations. We tend to think that if somebody has failed, well, we, have, we now have a definition of treatment resistant, what we call, and if somebody has tried two drugs in good you know, concentrations at good doses and it hasn't worked, then we call them treatment resistant. And at that point, we suggest that everybody be evaluated to see whether they're there is something other than a medication that can work because at that point, once you are treatment resistant, the chances, you know, we know this too from studies, the chances of getting seizure free completely from trying medicine after medicine after medicine is 5% per year. And 5% per year, you can look at it one of two ways, glass half empty, half full. I'm 22. <laughs> so, I mean, but it takes a lot of years to get, to get uh, a lot of people seizure free. So um, at that point, it definitely is worth going to a specialized epilepsy center and seeing whether there are things other than drugs that can help you. For some people, there will be. For other people, there won't be, at which point the 5% per year starts to look better. Great, great question there. Why don't you go over to this side? Um, Dr. Cloyd, I just appreciate you presenting on the rescue meds and I uh, wanted to know that um, uh, we were able to use that with my son when he was quite a bit younger, so thank you for that. And um, I'm from Minnesota and um, hard to argue with success in medical marijuana, so that was very nice to hear about your story also with your daughter. Um, I, I look at that also with caution. My son is um, 36, he has LGS. Be really nice to be able to try medical marijuana, but as you know, Dr. Cloyd, Minnesota, that's not possible yet. I just wanted your perspective on uh, what you see for that happening in Minnesota as far as that new bill that Governor Dayton has signed and whether or not there's going to be, um, you know, time wise, some research going on there with medical marijuana. Thank you. Uh, so we are now another state which will uh, permit the use of medical marijuana, marijuana for eligible patients. That law was enacted last month, signed by the governor. There will take some time to set up the distribution system. There's going to be some efforts to ensure quality of product that's dispensed. Uh, 
There's going to be some cost to patients and families. There will be some effort at record keeping. Um, I don't know whether it rises to the level of research, but there will be some effort to try to understand uh, the benefits of it. And uh, I don't have an exact timetable, but it, I'm guessing by early 2015, uh, uh, people living in Minnesota will have access to medical marijuana. Thank you. We're going to go to this side uh, for a question. And just to remind folks, we do have several more panels. So we have five more minutes of questions. I'm going to shut up right now so we can get to some of them. And then we will uh, realize there will be other panels to ask questions to. So ma'am, please. Hi. Um, I have a child. She's now 33. And she has intractable epilepsy and has used multiple drugs and surgery and VNSs and and such, and I wonder why there are no studies being done for medical marijuana with adults. I just find that kind of mind-boggling, <laughs> actually. Um, uh, well, a lot of it has to do with the ability to do a small study in what we call orphan drug uh, approval. So uh, the, the company that's funding the study only has to do one smaller study to be able to get it approved. Um, when you start doing it, and, and so like you could do it in the Dravet or the pediatric um, uh, catastrophic epilepsies, if we're allowed, still allowed to use that term. Um, and once uh, it's available, then we would presumably be able to use it off label for other types, just like Onfi. Onfi or Colbazam is really only approved for children with Lennox Gastaut, but we, we kind of use it uh, for a lot of other um, patient populations now. Also, sure. I, I haven't heard it said yet, but ma marijuana is a, is, is a Schedule One drug with cocaine and heroin, which prohibits the free testing of it, which means that universities, am I right? Public universities, they get no money to do tests. It's as long as it's prohibited by the federal government from as a Schedule One drug, there can't be tests. So the, one of the great imperatives is to remove that it from the Schedule One and put it in a lower Schedule drug so that that kind of research can then commence. Thank you, Elizabeth. Let's go to the question in the center sure to this gentleman. It isn't. I don't know. Well, but that's okay. Hi, uh, <clears throat> my name is Dimitri Furman. I have a son who has a uh, very strange lesion in his insula that we've had a hard time figuring out how to operate on, and so uh, we haven't done any surgeries. Um, Failed, uh, I guess, somewhat failed three drugs and uh, had a um, better success with ketogenic diet, but also not seizure-free. He has one seizure a day. Uh, I had a uh, couple of questions for Dr. French, actually. So uh, the first question that I have a hard time figuring out is that, so, so the diet had some success, and then the, the drugs had the side effects. Actually, would like to compliment you first and foremost for saying that some of these side effects that are displayed on the label are not necessarily everything. And so like once, once the drug, even a well-known drug like trileptal or Kepar goes in, in, into rotation, things happen that are not known. And uh, I guess we've been getting a lot of resistance as a family, and we're a family of engineers and a family of a lot of data and charts and everything like that. And so. We've been getting a lot of resistance from, from the uh, medical community, at least doctors that we've, we've interacted with, as to side effects that we noticed. And, and, and they're like, well, it's not possible. <laughs> well, this is happening. This is the data. I, I, it's not, I'm not being, this is objective data. And so Trileptal introduced the day seizures for us, and Kepra introduced all sorts of other craziness. But the question that I have is, why in the medical profession we're not trying things that are more isolated first, meaning, and, and easier to get in and out of. And so, so like, for example, we all established here the ketogenic diet or all sorts of other dieter, ter, dietary therapies have success in some ways, right? They have actually a very high level of success compared to even some of these medications. Why, why not try those type of medications, those therapies first, because it's easy to get on and off of them, so you don't, at least don't mix the data with other medications in the picture. 
why do doctors resist to do something like that first before we, before we try the medication? It's very hard to get on and off of. And then once you mix them all together, then who knows what's going on? It, it, it gets back to what I was talking about before. By the way, I just wanted to comment on your, your excellent comments about you have to listen to people when they tell you about side effects, just like the blue fingernails, right? Um, sometimes they're, they're very striking and eventually we get enough reports, and, I, and I'm gonna say this on behalf of the FDA, when there are unusual side effects, it's really important to report them to the FDA so that there can be a, a more information from a number of people to say this isn't just one person, this is several people. And I'm gonna give you just one example um, when topiramate had been out, uh, Topamax had been out for maybe a decade, a, a patient of mine came and said, you know, when I take this stuff, I don't sweat. And I'm like, really? <laughs> you know, you don't sweat and you notice this and you just notice this now? But I'm like, okay, okay. Well, it turns out that that is a very important side effect and some children stopped sweating and were getting heat stroke because they couldn't um, sweat and release their heat. So it's very important to listen to people. Very, uh, very similarly, I had a patient very early on a drug called Vigabatrin or Sabril who told me, I, you know, I started this drug and I was bumping into things. And I first I thought he was unsteady. And then I realized that his vision was not good uh, to the sides. And it turns out that a third of people who get put on this drug lost their vision to the side, but because they didn't lose the vision to the front, it wasn't noticed until 100,000 people had taken the drug. So we have to listen to our patients. We absolutely have to. So thank you for that. And thanks. And we have time for just one more question, and I'm going to go right there. <laughs> and so I'm not a question. I actually just wanted to respond to the woman who was asking about adult epilepsy. Uh, my name is Nicole Foreman. I'm the medical director at Insys Therapeutics. Um, and we are in the pre-IND stage, um, as Dr. Porter was um, helping you to understand, for pharmaceutical CBD. And I just wanted to let the woman know that we are um, pursuing research in adult epilepsy as well as orphan-designated um, pediatric epilepsies. And we do have a booth out there. We, we could engage you and talk more about that. So I Thank just wanted you. to respond. Thank you so much. And let me please join me for giving a round of applause for our wonderful session. Here.